Good evening. My name is Michael Davis. I'm a public information officer with Great Basin Incident Management Team 1. Welcome to our community update for September 1st. Currently, Camp Creek Fire is at 1,869 8, 1 acres, zero percent containment, and we have 436 people on the incident. We've got a lot of information for you tonight. Our first speaker will be Operations Section Chief Matt Call. Uh, Matt will discuss what's going on with the fire and future operations. Next up, we'll have Captain Brad O'Neill of the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office to discuss preparations for evacuations. He'll be followed by Mr. Chuck Redman, who is our incident meteorologist. Uh, following Chuck, we'll have Mr. Steve Zeal, who is our fire behavior analyst. We'll wrap up with uh, comments from our incident commander, Mr. Evans Quo, and uh, then I'll close this out. Thank you for joining us. Uh, here's Mr. Matt Call. Thanks, Mike. Again, I'm Matt Call. I'm operations, one of the operations chiefs on, on the Camp Creek fire. Uh, it's Friday, and it's a little bit more sunny today, so you've probably seen a little bit more smoke today, which, which for in our mind right now isn't necessarily a bad thing, and we'll kind of explain that. Uh, it's been pretty wet, which has slowed down some of our production, but it's, uh, it's allowed the fire to really get knocked down. So I'm going to explain kind of what we're doing here and why uh, a little bit more dry weather for a couple days is, is kind of good for us. So we're on the uh, Mount Hood Forest, and this is the, uh, the Portland watershed, and this perimeter here is our fire. Uh, and these lines can, can be a little bit confusing if you haven't seen them before, but this perimeter here is, is basically what they're counting as that about 1,900 acres. What we're trying to do is keep it in as small as perimeter as possible, but we can't just put control line wherever we want. We have to look for the best opportunity. So where we've done that is on these sides, we've done it against some roads uh, because there's really dense fuel. It takes a lot of time and effort to make those control lines. So we've used on these, on the south side and this north side, we've used the, the 12 and the 14 roads. What that does though, is that puts some unburned fuel between the edge of the fire and our, and our control line. So what we have to do is remove some of that fuel next to the road so the fire kind of gets more on the ground. And then what we'll do is introduce fires to a little bit at a time so we're in control of the fire and the fire doesn't get up in the tops of the trees. Because if it gets in the tops of the trees, it gets in that moss, the lichen, and it spots, and that causes us more problems. The problem is, is if it's really rainy and wet, uh, that fire doesn't carry, and we have a lot of little spots, and then we have to go cut, like control each one of those, and that takes a lot of effort. So we want fire here, but not outside of it. We're having pretty good luck, except when it gets really wet. So this, this dry weather is actually pretty good for us for a couple of days. We have a lot of uh, machines, like heavy equipment, all work, working all through here with some hand crews. They're removing fuels uh, and making this uh, a containment line on, on this side of the fire, on this east, excuse me, this west side. The same thing is going to happen over here on the west side, but we're just a couple of days out. One of the things you've probably seen is some heavy equipment sitting off the 26 road. That's kind of... Uh, or backstop that's kind of the the uh, the bench right now so as we need them we're putting them in putting them to work so just because they're sitting there doesn't mean uh, we don't need them and we don't want them we're just trying to stack the deck in our favor so we're slowly putting those guys to work uh, as as we need them we've had a hard time getting resources so right now finally getting what we need and we're just kind of stacking our, our pile pretty deep uh, this communications tower is almost protected as well and that's that's a little bit out there so that's kind of the, the, uh, the big overview. What we're gonna do is we're gonna show you a, an infrared image and kind of show you where the heat is. Hey, Mike, can I have you hold this mic for me? Absolutely. Thanks. So, Stay behind you. Right, let me grab this iPad. One of the tools that we use, let me get by, by the mic. One of the tools we use is uh, an infrared, we, we do uh, infrared flights once a night and it gives us this image. So I, I'm zoomed way out. So we can see the Highway 26, we can see the watershed right here and then this is our fire. The color is depicting of how hot the, the edge of the fire is. So I'm gonna zoom in. This tool allows us to really see where the heat is on the fire. This gives us an idea what the terrain looks like. So you see this, this edge here is where we introduce fire and it's pretty easy to see this road here is a good kind of obvious control line. And we've widened that out a little bit, meaning remove some of the fuels. But if we don't remove all of the the fuels here, if we don't burn that out, then that fire can get ahead of steam and, and jump this fire line and work its way down to the watershed. So 
will work fire up along here and then slowly that fire will creep back into there. One thing of note is just because this is all shown as fire perimeter inside doesn't mean it's like moonscaped. Uh, there might be some trees that are torched out. There might be some really blackened areas, but it's not standard placement. A lot of times it's on the ground. It's a kind of a dynamic mosaic environment. So just to be clear, it's, it's, it's kind of confusing because it all looks like fire. Granted, that's all could be burned in there as, and is what we call like solid black. Uh, not a high likelihood that it will escape our parameter, but it's not just one big moonscaped uh, kind of landscape. This will give you an idea of what the, the terrain is that we're looking at. It's a, kind of hard to see on a flat map, but it is a three-dimensional environment that we're looking at. And so we have, you know, some limitations with the way crews and the equipment can work. You can't always go up and down those slopes really easily and real quickly. So it takes quite a bit of time, especially in the fuels that we have as dense as they are here. And we'll try to throw in some photos for you to kind of see how much fuel is really out there. So as the days go by, we'll keep this updated and, and uh, try to give you some different perspectives of this. But uh, this is one of the things that we use quite a bit for the folks on the ground to actually have uh, real-time intelligence and allow them to be productive. That's all I've got, Mike. Thank you. All right, good evening. My name is Captain Brad O'Neill with the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office. Uh, part of my job is to work with the Clackamas County Emergency Operations Center, uh, which we've been doing since this fire actually started last week. Uh, we have been hearing uh, some comments from the public about uh, evacuations. And that's my, uh, one of my sole purposes is evacuations. Just to be clear, as of right now, there are no evacuations issued for Clackamas County. Uh, we have uh, developed a bunch of contingency zones and uh, we encourage you to go to our Clackamas County wildfires webpage uh, for the most updated information on those zones uh, and any changes that may come up uh, in regards to any changes with the, the fire activity. Other things that Clackamas County Emergency Operations Center does is we're in direct contact with the incident management team up here in Sandy. Uh, we communicate multiple times a day, uh, sharing information, uh, making sure that we're all on the same page and working collaboratively together as one big team. This is the first time uh, in my history that I've seen a team work so well together. Um, everything is going uh, very smooth, uh, very good communication, uh, and we are prepared for this, this event. Uh, other things that we've been doing in Clackamas County is preparing a uh, possibility of evacuation uh, sites for both people and livestock. And uh, with that, um, those are last resort options. Uh, so we just encourage you to think about if you have livestock, if you have friends and family that you can reach out to, to see if uh, there is an option for you to uh, evacuate to in the case that we do need to issue evacuations. But again, I just want to reiterate, uh, your county is working for you. Uh, we're working hard. We're going to continue to work hard until this is no longer a threat. Um, and I thank you very much and appreciate your support and feedback. So hi, Chuck, uh, Chuck Redman, uh, National Weather Service in Boise, but on this, uh, for here, I am the incident meteorologist um, for the fire, the Camp Creek fire. So, um, so uh, basically what I'm here for is pr uh, provide firefighter safety and I give weather information to uh, the incident management team and they will fight the fire based on what the weather conditions are going, what's going on with the weather. So. Um, so an interesting little tidbit, uh, you know, Weather Service employees, Weather Bureau employees, as it was in the past, um, has been coming to fires uh, since 1928. Matter of fact, today is the 95th anniversary of the first uh, incident meteorologist coming to a fire. Uh, that was by Leslie Gray, who worked for the Weather Service office or Weather Bureau office in San Francisco back in the 1920s. So what's the weather gonna be like next couple days? We've had a storm system come through the fire area uh, last couple days, uh, bring a little cold front and a lot of precipitation across the fire area. We're looking for, we've seen about an inch, inch and a half total over the last three days of precipitation. Um, and now that storm has kind of moved off to the south and then also west. So that's given us more 
northeast winds across the fire area. So that's, that's why we've smelled the smoke the last two days. That northeast wind pushing uh, the smoke down uh, towards Portland, Sandy, Gresham area. That storm is going to be moving off to the, the east uh, the next couple of days. So those winds uh, will, be, will shift from a, a northeast direction to a more westerly direction. So we should see improving conditions in the smoke uh, you know, by tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. So what are we looking at the next several days? Uh, quick warming, drying trend um, through at least the first part of the weekend before we see another storm system uh, bring more precipitation into the area um, by the end of the weekend in the first part of next week. Um, we are also looking for a threat of some thunderstorms to move uh, into the, the region uh, Saturday. Uh, maybe a little bit of precipitation, but probably the biggest concern uh, for the fire and fire crews would be the potential for some gusty winds with any thunderstorm potential. Now, so we, I talked about the next cold front coming in uh, Sunday, Monday. Uh, going into next week, we will see a, a more long-term warming trend, just a few degrees each day, and a slow drying trend uh, the, through most of next week. Um, so that's what we're looking at for weather now. Um, and that's all I got. Hi, I'm Steve Ziegel. Uh, my function with the management team is to serve as a fire behavior analyst. My focus is the fuels or the burnable vegetation out there, uh, the weather, and the topography in the fire area. Uh, I use a variety of, of tools and resources to determine uh, rate of spread or how fast the fire will travel across the landscape, uh, what direction the fire will spread, and uh, the timing of the fire spread. Uh, I do that over time based on fuel weather topography. Uh, my task is to determine the characteristics uh, of the fire, uh, flame lengths, uh, the potential for crowns, uh, crown fire involvement, uh, backing rates, uh, if the fire will spot or how far ahead of the main fire we could have spot fires and the likelihood of that. Uh, uh, as we know, a lightning strike started the, the fire on August 25th. Uh, that's only a week ago now. Uh, during the height of that occurred during the height of the uh, uh, summer fire season. Uh, previous weather was uh, very hot and dry for a long time. Uh, the area had not seen rainfall for a couple months. Uh, that produced uh, very dry forest vegetation. Uh, for the first several days, the fire exhibited a wide range of, of characteristics, uh, including rapid rates of spread. Uh, long-range spotting, and areas of crown fire involvement. Uh, the fire grew for several days while aggressive suppression efforts were, were being uh, conducted. Uh, share a picture uh, of, the, uh, of the area. A lot of uh, the uh, Bull Run watershed is uh, heavily vegetated uh, with fuels of all sizes. Uh, it's kind of a rainforest. Uh, it looks pleasant, but when dry, uh, uh, it'll carry fire. Moss, trees, uh, here's an area that uh, uh, with the moss and the, the undergrowth, uh, yeah, very conducive to uh, a wide range of fire behavior. Another picture uh, showing the, the uh, gross accumulation of vegetation uh, that we've been dealing with. So uh, abundant vegetation, uh, current fire size, 1,869 uh, acres. Uh, another, another picture. Uh, and then it rained. And then it rained. So the question at hand is, uh, what effect did the rain have? And what kind of fire behavior can we expect in the future? Uh, as uh, the incident meteorologist indicated, well over a half to over an inch of rain fell in the area. That stopped the fire spread. And now smoldering fire, creeping fire uh, with limited flames are present. Uh, but due to the effects of uh, a full summer of drying and deep vegetative mat, or we call it duff, 
an abundance of decaying logs, heavy, heavy uh, fuel loading. Uh, it's still fairly dry. Another picture uh, showing that uh, uh, we're consuming surface and the next picture, uh, it rained, but did it penetrate? Uh, no, I went out there and the, the duff or the vegetative mat of three to six inches deep, uh, it was dry under the uh, under the duff, uh, even though it rained so much. So we are going to have some drying. Uh, fire area is going to retain heat in those uh, large dry fuels. Uh, we will retain heat probably through or into the fall. Uh, there's going to be various amounts of heat present uh, along with av available fuels. Uh, there will be smoke present in varying amounts and uh, uh, fire activity, which will be wind or weather dependent. So uh, that's uh, kind of a, a view of where we're at and where we're going. Uh, thank you for your interest. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Evans Cole. I'm the incident commander for Great Basin Team 1. So I just, I just want to provide a few thoughts and uh, summarize what uh, we've been talking about, everything from what operations got planned, what the counties and, and local fire departments have planned, as well as um, what weather and fire behavior have been talking about. So over the course of the next five to ten days, the way we see, we see things playing out based on everything you just heard is we're probably going to see a continue, continual drying out of the fuels. And, uh, and as the fuels continue to dry out, we'll probably start to see an increase in fire activity. Um, and we'll probably also see mo more of a return to more active fire spread. Um, and and as, as those conditions start to occur, I think a lot of the plans that operations talk about are going to come, come into bear. Um, so the, the main thing that we're trying to do is we're, we're going to be implementing a series of indirect as well as direct uh, suppression actions. And as um, operations may have alluded to, Direct attack is when we get right up on the fire's edge. So we are going direct in some of the places, specifically up in the uh, up in the upper headwaters of um, uh, the south fork of Cedar Creek, um, where we are able to get close to the fire. The reason why we're going direct in that particular area is because we've been able to mitigate the snag hazards. So not only are we have dead trees out there, but some of the uh, the shallower rooted green trees, they're very prone to falling over when they get fire weakened. That presents a hazard to the firefighters because the tree could look perfectly safe, but because if the root system burns out, then they have a tendency to tip at, at, moments no at any moment's notice. Um, so because the ground is a little more gentle in there, we've been able to get in there with the uh, heavier equipment, such as the feller bunchers, as well as the saw teams, and knock the, uh, cut those snags down to make the make that particular area safe for firefighters. Other places, and we've been assessing whether or not we can go um, direct on, like, say, the west side or the southwest side, where it's a uh, quite a bit steeper in terrain um, and more hemlock, um, the, the snag potential there cannot be mitigated. So as a result, we're having to back off and use the main roadways or the indirect hand line uh, that we've constructed. Um, as part of the indirect strategy, though, is we, we have to if we go indirect and we're using a, a containment line that's not right up against the fire's edge, um, we have to either do one of two things. We either do something with the fuels inside that fire line up against the main fire, or we bring the main fire to the control line. We're doing something about the fuels, um, that's a heavy lift. It requires a lot of effort, a lot of labor. Um, we just don't have the time for. So fi putting fire on the ground through firing operations, or what some people call back burning, is a lot more exp uh, faster way to go. And that is what's occurred over on the, um, I guess that's like the northwest side of the fire, off the 12 road system right above the watershed. And so that has a, was an effort that um, operations have been undertaking for a number of days prior to the rains. And they brought the main fire down to that road, and they spent the last few days mopping it up or securing it, extinguishing it, reducing the spotting potential. Um, the rain helped. Um, but that is the area of the fire that this evening we're going to report as contained. And we'll talk a little bit more about containment here in a little bit. But uh, we've, we've been able to contain that. Not only do we stop the forward spread of the fire, but we've also secured it enough to the point where we don't think any residual heat in that area is going to jump our lines. Um, so direct here, or indirect here, we plans on continuing to burning out the road. We're going direct here. 
over on the southwest side of the fire and the south side of the fire using the 14 road system that's going to continue to be an indirect approach which means we have to wait for the fuels to recover a little bit but based on the forecast we're anticipating sometime in the next few days the fuels will dry out enough for us to resume firing operations so you'll likely to see very similar activity that we did on the northwest side we're going to repeat that same action on the south side and ultimately bring the main fire to those roads. Once we bring the main fire to the roads, we can secure it, mop it up, and then we'll be able to call those sections contained. Um, so that's what we're anticipating seeing for the next five to 10 days. Um, there is a little bit of uh, some, there's still some concern out there. We have a lot of persistent heat. We're still trying to figure out how to address the east side, whether or not we can go direct or indirect. Um, but as we get more people to, to look, take a look at that, we can assess the hazards. Um, and look at the best options, we'll be able to report out what our exact plans are on that side. But for the meantime, right now, the whole south flank, we're still looking at taking an indirect approach using the road network. But if we find an opportunity to either shrink the, um, the size of the indirect or go direct, we'll let you folks know. Um, because I imagine your people that live on this side of the fire are probably very concerned, interested and concerned about that. Um, we've also got a, a number of questions at the PIOs handed us, um, and th those mostly came from some of the on questions online, so we are reading those, we are paying attention to them. Uh, the first question is, why are we not showing any containment despite several days of fire growth? So that's a good question, and let me touch on that for a minute. So just because we stopped the fire, uh, the f forward spread of the fire, um, I mean, that's, that's one thing. That's one, that's the, like the first step in suppressing the fires. We stop the forward spread, and we either bring it out to a control line or we establish a control line right on the fire's edge like we have on the northeast side. Um, but we have to secure it, secure it en enough, we have to, which means we have to extinguish all the heat from the fire's edge all the way interior far enough in that we're fairly confident that it won't spot. Um, in other words, uh, burn upwards, ignite things like the moss or some branches or leaves that can then ultimately, if the wind picks up, they, they, they jump our lines. Um, so that takes, a, that takes a while. And the heavier the fuel loading is out there, which this, this area is, is renowned for very heavy fuel loading, it's gonna take a while, um, a matter of days. But I am expecting to see some increase in containment. Um, exactly how much? It's based on a mathematical equation. So we're estimating that we have about one mile of containment um, already secured, and we're gonna calculate how, that, how does that one mile compare to the rest of the perimeter of the fire. So let's just say, for example, the per overall perimeter of the fire, if you measure every nook, you know, every twist and turn, let's just say we have 20 miles of perimeter, one mile of, one mile of containment versus 20 miles of perimeter, that's 5%. But the, well, our GIS folks are calculating that right now, and we'll be able to report out that number. Um, so the second question we have is um, how concerned should residents in the communities uh, from in Sandy or Welch's be? And what would the fire have to do to reach us? Again, and that's another good question, and that's something that we've been assessing in the entire time we've been here. Um, the short answer is it's very wind dependent. And so if we have, for example, a wind coming out of the west, then the fire wants to, wants to go to the east. That's just the nature of how fire spreads and fire behaves. Um, terrain alignment also kind of comes into play. And so given that most of your drainages out here run from uphill from the east, downhill towards the west, we have a wind alignment with the westerly wind. It's kind of like a funnel, uh, with the way the terrain lays in there. So a westerly wind would push the fire to the east, and that's where we would expect the most amount of growth. Okay, so specifically the question was asked about Sandy back off to the, the west, southwest. So we would have to have like a northeast wind or at least an easterly wind component. And since the drainages line up, the, wind, the drainages uh, would funnel the wind in that direction and we could see potentially sustained growth if we were to have a very strong wind event out of the east or northeast, um, and we were also in red, flat, red flag conditions, meaning the temperatures are well up there, you know, 90 degrees, the humidities are, are quite a bit down there, so like less than 30% humi uh, relative humidity, um, and the fuels will also have to have a number of days of drying, such as we could potentially experience later on in September. Um, however, given the amount of emphasis and effort and work that we put into the west side of the fire, I would say that that risk is going down all the time. And as we achieve more containment, then the amount of heat, the heat source that a easterly wind would rekindle and push and jump our lines, again, that, that likelihood is going down all the time. For folks in Welch's, which it's probably a little off our map, down off to the southeast of our fire, 
we would have to have a fairly fairly strong sustained northwest wind um, again with similar red flag conditions of all you know all the hallmarks of high temperatures low humidity um, a lot of fuel the fuels would have to recover from the recent rains and be re readily able to burn actively so we would have to have a fairly strong sustained northwest wind a question we got a few nights ago at one of the public meetings was um, which direction of the wind is a good wind for us well honestly that the answer to that depends on where do you live and so I think as you know you folks are paying attention to our fire also pay attention to the wind direction yes we do have a, a forecast for northeast wind right now today um, about 15 miles an hour which when you bring it down to the surface level given the, how dense the vegetation is 15 miles ends up being five six mile an hour uh, winds on the surface which is not that much and more so given that we had um, that today's w uh, winds uh, were preceded by two or three days of wet conditions and the fuels aren't very conducive to burning again I would say that that threat is low which but however I would be paying attention in say middle of September after we start getting back into a warming drying trend and we do have a w uh, east wind in the forecast at that point it, definitely I, I would be concerned and that's one of the things we're concerned about so that's why we bring in incident meteorologists like Chuck and Mike to help inform us as far as what we have and what we you know several days out so we can start pre-planning for that um, I think if more to the point so the third question is how close is the fire to our homes and how fast would it have to reach um, or how fast could it reach us if it crosses the 14 road I don't know exactly who asked this question and where their home is um, but since they mentioned the 14 road Let's just use, um, can we scroll up the map up a little bit? Let's just use Marmot, uh, Marmot Creek Road, Marmot Road for, for example. So approximately three miles as a crow flies. Um, but the thing you have to realize is right now, so the 14 road system is kind of up on a ridge. So the fire would have to cross that road, which right now we have a lot of firefighters out there keeping that from happening. Then it would have to go downhill, and fires don't burn as fast down, downhill as they do uphill. Um, cross I believe it's Arrow Creek go up another little small ridge and then down into another unnamed drainages and then go back up um, and then finally cross a, the one last final little ridge before it comes down into where the private homes are uh, along uh, Marmot Creek Road so up down up down all that will slow the fire spread down um, and then the farther south you get, especially on some of the private land, you start running into more harvest units from, I don't know, anywhere from back in the 90s and maybe even more recent, that all those type of fuel changes will also have an effect of slowing the fire down a little bit. But near, based on some calculations from our fire, be, fire behavior, we figure under uh, red flag conditions and a strong sustained wind, we'd be, probably be looking at about a ballpark about a quarter mile per hour. So roughly speaking, if we were three miles away, it would take at least 12 hours uh, for the fire to get from point A to point B to, to make that three miles. However, that's assuming we have a sustained, throughout the entire 12 hour period, we have a sustained wind and those hot dry conditions. As we get into September, as you all know, the, the days get shorter. And so the likelihood of us having a sustained 12 hour um, high wind, high red flag condition is it goes down. So our best estimate right now, based on the modeling is it would probably take several burn periods in order for a fire under those extreme conditions to make it that three mile distance. That based, that ties in nicely with the plan that um, Captain O'Neill talked about is we, our notification procedures, how much time they need to get the word out and, and inform the residents that we're going to from a level, you know, from zero evacuation warnings to a level one, level two, level three. So right now, I mean, I still have concerns to be honest, but then again, I'm paid to be a pessimist, um, but I'm feeling a little more, op more optimistic um, as we move forward. So hopefully that answers all the questions. With that, I'll give it back to Michael. Thank you, sir. All right, so we've had some, uh, had a lot of information there for you. Uh, some good news, we're gonna have some containment. We've got extra crews coming in. Uh, we've stopped the forward progress of, of the fire for the, at this time. Uh, so there's a there's a lot uh, for you to digest there uh, If we have if you have additional questions uh, and comments, which I'm sure you will please enter those in the comments uh, And we will do our best to uh, get back and uh, and answer those questions for you uh, We at uh, Great Basin team one uh, appreciate your need uh, for timely and accurate information uh, to that end we've got uh, as you've seen a very robust uh, online presence, but we understand not everybody gets their information online. 
So we've got public information officers out in the community every day speaking with residents face to face. We've also got a phone line set up that you can call in uh, anytime from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So we're going to take every uh, step that we can to get that information out there to you. So any needs you have, any questions you have, please reach out. That's what we're here for. Thank you very much and have a good evening.